What is going on, guys? Welcome to another episode of the Mask and Health Solutions Podcast, where I'm joined by Ruan Mpagala. You know, <laughs> I had to say it quick because I don't want to screw it up. But, you know, he's going to correct me along the way and enlighten us on a whole bunch of topics that pertain to men. And the beauty of it is that he has a podcast called the Rwando Podcast, which, you know, I've already started to listen to. There's a lot of good stuff there, which is dedicated to us dudes who always want to learn. And like I said before, you know, off air and even talking to Ruan, it's like everything when it comes to masculinity kind of exists on a on a spectrum and it can't just be singled out into one thing. But first and foremost, Ruan, how are you today, man? I'm doing great. How are you doing, CJ? Doing awesome, man. Looking forward to this. The first thing that I wanted to ask you, though, and kind of just open up with is what got you started down this road of like coach men and, you know, helping people find their life's purpose? Yeah, uh, well, initially going all the way back my childhood, I was very anxious. I was extremely shy, which is already a problem in itself. But once you have puberty, you're interested in girls. <laughs> it becomes like a, a heavier, more tangible issue. Right. And, you know, I could speak of, about it, you know, lightly now, but you know, I was very depressed. I was very closed off on top of that feeling like I couldn't connect with the opposite sex, let alone like even I wasn't even good at making friends, to be honest. But that got me into personal development. I, you know, I found things like weightlifting and combat sports. I, you know, I did all sorts of things basically trying to become confident um, just in life. You know, I even, you know, I, I was I went to officer candidate school for the Marines because I thought they would they would make me confident. There were pros and cons to that. Like I, I was trying everything. I even joined a sex cult at one point in my early 20s. Like, <laughs> there's a lot of things. I won't go into all the side stories, but I tried a lot of things basically trying to find myself. Mm -hmm. um, and, and as I eventually started developing confidence, oh, actually, one of the biggest things I think is relevant to your audience is what really made me think, okay, I really have a problem. It's not just me being sad or depressed, is that my anxiety led to a psychogenic dysfunction. Like, I couldn't get it up. And I was physically healthy. My testosterone was fine. The plumbing was fine. But like, I was so shut down and I don't know what, I didn't get my hormones chest, uh, tested, but I know something was because of my mental state, my body had shut down It affected my libido affected, you know, my manhood on like on a literal level. Yeah. So that made me like really take it seriously to the point where I became obsessed. I tried everything under the sun and eventually through various things that maybe we'll talk about today, I got in touch with my instincts. I learned how to feel from a masculine perspective, not like the self-care way that a lot of feminine self-help talks about, mm -hmm. which is not really relevant to most men. I think eventually, what do you want to do once you have some, once you solve the problem for yourself, you want to help other people that led into yeah. coaching. I, I have other male related topics that are interests that made me start a podcast. And, and that's how I ended up here today. No, that's beautiful, man. It's kind of, I think for myself, I kind of live by the philosophy of, I think the whole purpose of us being here, I believe in a karmic contract. I think you all come in here. We all come in here and say, yo, there's a reason why I think God put us here. And he's like, okay, cool. I gave you a riddle. Go figure it out. And then when you mm -hmm. do figure it out now, he's like, all right, cool. Now you're responsible for telling other people how to figure out that riddle. You know, and yeah. then I think we as a collective can really start to, you know, really ascend and I think that's one of the beautiful things about having these issues is that when you do figure it out and you know, you are a good soul, you're like, I can't keep this for myself because what good is it for me to have all this information and then die? You know, and I yeah. think that kind of weighs heavily on a lot of people that want to do good. And I think that's kind of why God puts certain people in positions where it's like, you got to figure this out. Then you got to share it with the rest of the world, right? Totally. Yeah. It's like in Greek philosophy, in Greek uh, mythology, there's the character Chiron, who is mm -hmm. the wounded healer. And I think, you know, I think a lot of people, that's a strong archetype, I think, in society nowadays, because people have problems. And now there's actually means to share with the world. If you have a podcast or social media, you can actually share, you know, everybody who teaches anything, whether it's fitness or philosophy or anything, they started with a problem. Otherwise, you wouldn't have been interested in it. Right? Like my friends who grew up like naturally confident or naturally good with women, they, they're not interested in talking about this stuff because it was never a problem for them, which was mm -hmm. obvious. But like for us, for people who have a problem, that becomes your interest. Then you find the solution. Then you can share it, like you said. A hundred percent, man. Because it's kind of like, I'm a big believer that the only things that really get us going, you know, as far as human beings go, and I remember Tony Robbins was talking about this too, it's either pain or pleasure. Now, for a lot mm -hmm. of us, it's kind of, we know what we got to do in order to get like, you know, more money and get all the material things we want in this life. But it's not really until you feel pain that you really start moving in that direction a whole lot faster. You know, for the most part, totally. we kind of grow stagnant and it's like we just avoid that. 
Yeah. Like, like, let's say when you're dealing with somebody that you just kind of came across and you're, you're kind of talking to them, you're getting to know them. How do you start asking them questions about, hey, this is your purpose? Or how do you figure or help them figure out what their purpose is? Well, I mean, the first question I ask a lot of guys, especially if it's open ended, like they didn't come with a specific issue, is what do you want? The thing is, though, a lot of people can't answer that like immediately, unless you're someone who really like writes down his goals or, or, or has a problem he needs to solve. Like it's usually not that obvious. So then the next thing, which is usually related is what are you afraid of? Because like you're saying, there's pain and pleasure that are motivators, but pleasure has no stakes, right? Like people want to feel good, but it's not like, you know, if if a guy comes to me for coaching and he wants some help or he has something open-ended, like his purpose, he just feels like he's lacking, you know, I want him to go into his pain. I want him to go into what he feels pissed off about or what he feels frustrated about, because if he really feels that his psyche is not going to let him keep feeling that pain, right? It's, something's going to have to change. Whereas if what you do, what most people do, if they numb it out, they watch too much Netflix, porn, video games, whatever, you can kind of let 10 years pass without really feeling the pain that would have motivated you to do, take some drastic action. Like you have to take a bold move yeah. if you want to change when it comes to anything, you know? Yeah, dude. So it's kind of, I guess you got to pry that out of them. I mean, for myself, I'm, I'm no different. You know, you, you say those things and I'm like, it always goes back to self for myself. Like when I'm trying to, you know, you're trying to dissect on the person, but you can almost mirror it to how like, oh, wait a minute, I can step into this guy's shoes for a bit. Cause I remember what that was like too. And these coping mm-hmm. mechanisms exist in a lot of us. Like you mentioned porn, you mentioned alcohol and stuff. Like what are other things that you find that are pretty common for guys to just use as coping mechanisms to bury all those feelings away? I mean, I think we live in the age of, I mean, this is not anything new for me to say. It's like, this is the age of distraction. Like there are more mm-hmm. things than ever to give you those dopamine heads to distract you from what would move. Like I read a lot of history. I think you know, that's where I draw my, my biggest lessons from, from mm-hmm. as far as masculinity goes or being a man. Like a long time ago, like you look at the ancient Greeks, Romans, Mongols, whatever, there's a lot of nothing to do, right? Like either you're doing something you have to do so you don't starve to death, or your family doesn't starve, or there's a lot of just like looking around at the mountains and stuff. Like there wasn't like things to fill your time. So men could contemplate, you know, men could like be in touch with the instincts that would let them better themselves. And, and which is why, of course, in antiquity, men were so much harder than we are, right? Yeah. Just across the board, right? It's just, just how it is. Um, whereas like there's so many rewards for being soft. And I, I mean that like specifically being weak, not that you can't like take it easy sometimes, but like specifically men are rewarded for being weak more than ever before rewarded both by culture upbringing but also like if you don't want to do hard things there are a million things you can feel good doing to avoid that you know anything on a screen basically right like that's that's why i love the podcasting medium because obviously video is important too but you could put in earbuds and do push-ups or do yard work or milk your cow or whatever while also consuming (laughs) good good information good you know? content no yeah 100 percent, and that's kind of why i like i was a podcast at well actually going back i started off with audiobooks right like way back mm. in the day right and i remember listening to brian tracy he's the first person that really made me think about this stuff where i'm like wait a minute what am i doing in my life you know because <laughs> at that time i was a little bit lost i guess you could say where i was just trying to find myself as well and obviously you know you start off with brian tracy then you go into the podcasting world and that's the beauty of it is that we can share ideas in long form content and i think you know honestly people are more desperate for that now more than ever because you look at the totally. tiktok you look at the instagram you look at whatever it's like dude five seconds five seconds boom 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 it's like everybody's got the attention of a gold like a goldfish right so yeah that's kind of easy to get caught watching play. shorts i've never downloaded tiktok because i don't support communism but i <laughs> i CCP. you know yeah, even even like the most, I mean, there are podcasters who put out shorts and they're interesting. I watch them because I like what they have to say. Mm-hmm. But I don't know if I've ever had a positive impact from a five second clip, even the best five second clip. Like yeah. it does not make you think, it does not make you change what you're doing. But I love long form because a lot of times if I'm listening to a good conversation, I'll hit pause and then I'll say out loud by myself in my car, like what I would, it, 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 jogs, it jogs like my imagination. It mm-hmm. makes me think about stuff. And then, you know, anyway. No, oh, yeah, a little different because you know what the thing is too it's almost like you're living it's like reading a book almost that's the difference mm-hmm. that i find with like a podcast versus like the reels and stuff like and even now like i'm trying to get into it now for like the fitness side of things and i'm like okay well if this is the game that i gotta learn then i'm so be it right but like the like the name of the game is just holding people's attention for like less than three seconds so every step every three seconds you gotta do something like shift the screen do whatever so it's almost like you're just reeling people in with like constant little bits of like 
you know, distraction. And again, to your point, it's like anybody that consumes this again and again, it's almost like they fall into the trap of, I just need to consume more. And then I never really acquire anything worth having. And then next thing you know, it's like, I got three hours of doom scrolling and I yeah. lost those three hours of time. Right. So. Yeah. Anything that can be, you know, I, I, I like to equate attention with like physical effort, right? Like lifting a one pound weight has no effect on your body. <laughs> but if you read like Jung, that's like, benching your max or like that's training till mm -hmm. failure for your brain yeah. you know something like where you have to like really like concentrate Strain. there's no way you're not going to have an anabolic response i feel like in your mind yeah right? i mean I, I, analogously no yeah i think that's a great way to go about it and to draw that comparison another thing that i was just thinking about when you mentioned that was when you get somebody that's kind of come to you and let's say that he's a little bit soft you know soft dude you know mentally pretty weak you know physically pretty weak how do you, you know, how do you get them started onto something? Is it like you want to get them into literature? You want to get them into philosophy when it comes to just changing their mindset? Or do you just start with like habits? Well, habits are important, obviously. But if everybody knows the importance of habits, right? Like, mm -hmm. and especially like anyone who's come out to reach to me usually has listened to my podcast, like they know my ideas, right? So I don't want to spend too much time on telling him again what he has heard from me or anyone else that's giving, you know, saying the obvious, right? Mm -hmm. I really want to get him in touch with what is his desire, which might go, mean going into his pain. Like, I don't want to feel like a loser anymore. I don't want to feel like I'm, I don't want to feel fear of women or fear of money for the rest of my life or whatever the things are, money and women, you know, the obvious things most men desire, right? Like, I want him to like really be driven by his instincts, the way that when he's hungry or cold, he reaches for food or warmth, right? Because once he's in that mode, it's like someone who, who has a great habit of working out usually enjoys working out. Like he doesn't need motivation for it, right? Someone who's never done that, it's like the why, the reward system hasn't been built up yet. So even though he knows, oh, I should go to the gym, he like, oh, how could, what's the minimum? Like, like, let me get my two feet in the gym just to check it off and then leave. Those are all fine, I think, is habit building. But what I really care about is instincts. Because mm -hmm. once your feelings are driving you in the right direction, you're not fighting yourself anymore. And you know, I learned this in the realm of sexuality because there's certain things you can't fake when you when say you have ED. Like you, you, yeah. you have to get in touch with your feelings. Otherwise, you know, I, I was I was completely hooked on Viagra for a year because I was so wow. dead in my body. And the funny thing is, even on Viagra, sometimes it didn't work. It was, it was only when I really got in touch with my emotions, my, my, my repressed anger, my fears, my being willing to take shit from people mm -hmm. that kind of started to flip. And then suddenly my libido just came back and then I didn't need motivation for the things that I was trying so hard. Like I got kind of trapped in the pickup world for a little bit because, you know, 15 years ago, that's what most male advice consisted of <laughs> online. This is like, like pre YouTube. Yeah. So maybe even 20 years ago, and I, I there's pros and cons to that, but they never talk about the importance of actually feeling your desire. Like once you actually feel your instincts, that's where like charisma comes from. And I'm jumping around a lot, but like no, no, for I any issue, yeah. any male issue, like you have to feel that like warrior energy of like, I'm pissed off the way things are. There's something I want. That's what's going to make you do it. Yeah. And I mean, I think what you're describing basically is drive. You know, that's the mm -hmm. way I kind of sense it. Cause I remember being a kid and I just remember being so pissed off and that's what got me to work out. And it's like, I was driven. It's like, could I explain it? No, but I knew that I was angry. I knew that I was pissed and I knew I was going to do this because it was going to help me with everything else. And sure enough, mm -hmm. it kind of like creates a cascade. And to your point where you're talking about confidence before, whereas, you know, I'd have friends who couldn't talk to girls or they couldn't, you know, go up to like a group of people or they couldn't work out by themselves and stuff. And I never had that issue. Cause the thing is, it's like, when you are driven, you really don't give a fuck anymore, right? It's just mm -hmm. like, no, I got, I got to go do this. And it's kind of like where you mentioned that warrior mindset, that mentality of like, I just got to get it done. And when you just got to yeah. get it done, it's like, it, it, it's interesting because everything around you just kind of melts and you have one goal and one objective. I think, you know, as we grow, old, well, at least for myself, when I grew older, I kind of lost sight of that. And now I'm starting mm -hmm. to get it back. And it's kind of like, okay, you look at the successes that you've had in life and it's almost like you had that drive. You were driven by something, right? And I guess yeah. developing that mindset is, is the beauty of what I was able to take out from that experience, you know, that was painful to get from the get go, but eventually it led to my success in this. When you're working totally. with somebody though, how do you frame it in a way that you're like, I know you're hating the system right now and you might not be liking this, but how do you explain it to them where it's like, okay, this is the way it's going to work in the future. How do you go about framing it yeah. for them? Well, I also want to say on that, it's like, once you 
tap into it, it's easy, obviously, right? Yeah. For some, it's really hard, right? There's some people who they want to change, but, you know, 10 years of numbing has gone by or 10, you know, maybe their upbringing, like really conditioned that instinct out of them. And they can hear, listen to this, be like, oh, it's easy for you guys to say, but like, I just don't have that drive, right? Yeah. For me, like I said this earlier, like, well, he has pain. Mm-hmm. I mean, otherwise he wouldn't be interested. He wouldn't have reached out. He wouldn't be listening to a conversation like this. If there wasn't something, some dissatisfaction, like he might, yeah, or just like, like, fuck. You know, I think this is, you know, I, I, I tell a lot of guys to watch Breaking Bad or rewatch it or Fight Club. Like these are the two, oh, yeah. you know, fictions that I think really reawaken this something like if you if you're a man and you can enjoy those two i mean they're modern mythologies right mm-hmm. it's because there's something in you that it resonates with like oh yeah i want to stop doing what everyone else is telling me to do and actually live my life that's the mm-hmm. core of it right not that you have yeah. to be violent or cook meth or anything right it's like not? yeah <laughs> <laughs> yeah I mean, it's, it's something you could do yeah. but you know and so i, I usually I'll, I'll like really dig into a guy's pain you know and and most people avoid their emotional pain for, for obvious reason, right? It's unpleasant, but like go into it with them, right? It's, it's easier to reface some, this is kind of from trauma theory. Like a lot of trauma can be healed if you can talk about it without having the same fear response, right? That's where like a yeah. lot of, well, a lot of therapy around any kind of trauma has some basis in, not to say that, you know, pain is always trauma, but if we can go into it together and you can really feel like the dissatisfaction, that's what will eventually lead to drive and motivation. Interesting. Yeah. That's, I mean, it's kind of getting to that root cause again. It's one of the biggest issues, but uh, I just find that, like I said before, I mean, for myself too, like, I don't know if it's just me. It's like where I feel like back in my day, you know, like an old man now, it just seems like you had to work a lot harder than you do now. Like, it seems like, cause I was talking to a guy at work and, He's talking to me about Bumble and explaining like the Tinder and all that mm-hmm. to me. And I'm just like, bro, wait a minute. So you can get pussy like on express. <laughs> <laughs> you, you don't even have to go to like, you know, work for it at all. It's like, you can mm-hmm. just literally get a girl like shipped to your house. And it, it seems like we're creating a society to your point where it's like, it's almost like the soft man has taken over. Yeah. Well, I, I mean, with the Bumble era, right. Cause uh, how old are you, by the way? A 35. Okay. Yeah. Me too. All right. So okay, yeah. same exact age, Good probably year. experienced similar <laughs> things. That, yeah. Um, the thing is that I'm sure you've read the statistics, like the, the skew for men on something like Tinder, I think is like what the top 10% get over 90%, right? Yeah. It's, yeah. It, it's almost made it, it's made it way easier for the top, the, the high, high status guys, the elite, the Pareto elite. Mm-hmm. Uh, and it, if you're like, if you're like a, a five, not that I use rating systems often, but if you're like a five as a guy, you're probably getting no matches. Mm-hmm. Whereas in the nineties, let's say, or even the early two thousands, pre-social media, you would probably get a date if you're reasonably attractive, right? It's, you know, Tinder's, but, but the, the positive side of that is on a cultural level, I think a lot of guys complain about the feminization of men in society. Yeah. It's true. But if I, I almost, I feel like the silver lining though, is if you know how to re- claim your masculinity or like the, the bar for masculinity is actually quite low yeah. <laughs> more than ever before. Like it's not yeah. that hard to be in the Pareto elite of men because so many men have been conditioned to be particularly weak and Dude, particularly disconnected from their instincts. No, hundred percent. And I mean, that's the one thing where I tell my kid all the time where he's just like, Oh, this guy, I'm like, yo man, listen, right now you are in a good place. My friend, it's like, you're working mm-hmm. out, you know, you're getting in shape. I try to do my best to coach him on mindset and just kind of like, yo, you, you, you got your ass kicked in the game. It's not a bad thing, dog. Like you got to just, you know, pick it up and just keep going and, and kind of keep moving forward. And, and the thing is too, it's, it's like right now he doesn't realize, but I'm like, you know, he's already, he's almost my height and I'm six foot. Right. And he's like 12, <laughs> you know? So right. I'm like, okay, you know, you're growing, you're developing muscle mass. You got to develop confidence. You got to develop mindset. Cause that's the one thing where I'm like, that's going to really pull you apart from the pack. And that's the one thing that I think we had back in the day. It's like, you'd be playing outside. You'd be developing these skills. You'd be developing that culture. The one thing that I asked myself though, it's like, how do these guys, and I mean, how do they develop a culture of that? How do you go about, you know, hanging out with dudes that are like-minded if you're, if you're kind of scared and you're, you're scared of jumping into a place that's going to challenge you. Cause you mentioned martial arts. What are other places that you can get these guys like, a nice environment where they can start to be like, okay, cool. I'm getting my ass kicked. This is a good thing. <laughs> mm-hmm. 
I mean, I think that's the number one thing. I mean, I'll just speak for my personal life. I've been living outside the United States for most of the last decade, let's say. And we've been, I, I was a nomad before I got married, moving around a lot. Even with, since I got married, we've lived in a few different countries. So like finding good guy friends has been a little challenging, but the two things where I always find like-minded men are the jujitsu gym, because I already know they like to do hard things. They like to use their body. We have stuff to talk about. Obviously we have things mm -hmm. in common and chess clubs. <laughs> chess clubs. Yeah. I mean, this is honestly, this is kind of like my dad, dad era, new hobby, but like, <laughs> it's competitive. You use your brain. It's hard. It's not like, it's not like passive recreation and like, you know, mm -hmm. kind of like with, I don't know if, if, you've, if you've done martial arts, but like when you roll with somebody, you kind of get to know how they are as a person, even though they yeah. didn't talk. Chess is almost the same, even though it's not physical. It's like, you kind of know that they have an edge or not. I don't know. I don't know. I don't, this is not necessarily advice. This is just my personal life, but yeah. I think anything competitive, right? Like men need to compete to feel like themselves interesting yeah because it's funny that you say that like i listen to eddie bravo all the time too right you know mm. in his podcast and whatever and i do delve into like the conspiratorial side of things just because there's a whole bunch yeah. of craziness in the world and i'm like uh -huh. all right cool well the news isn't telling me the truth so i'm going to explore you know <laughs> different possibilities here but i do find that when he talks to other brazilian jiu-jitsu practitioners mma guys it seems like the mindset is very very different than what you see in the common man Right. And mm -hmm. I, I think there's something to environment and the places that, you know, it's almost like when you put a cell into two separate, you know, petri dishes, it's you're going to get a different cell every single time mm -hmm, because totally. of like the way that the environment can influence things. Right. Yeah. And I really do feel that that's something instrumental to making sure that guys can really develop themselves in that way that we kind of used to automatically. And that's kind of the one thing that I find is lacking, which is why I think martial arts or something along those lines. And now chess is going to be one of those things I'm going to have to look into. <laughs> yeah. Cause you know, I mean, the thing that was lost and I think I, well, I'm hoping that our generation maybe was the worst of it. Like participation trophies came into existence when we oh, were kids. Yeah. And I think, <laughs> I don't know for sure, but you know, I just looking at the culture has been kind of swinging right after like a, a few decades of swinging left. I think people are pushing against that. You know, a lot of people having these kinds of conversations. So I think it's good for, let's say, our children's generation, I'm hoping. Mm -hmm. But like one of the things you noticed is that a lot of men of our generation, because competitive instincts were so downplayed and aggression was so muted, you know, healthy outlet for aggression was so muted. A lot of men don't really understand respect. Uh -huh. Like respect yeah. is an idea. And then like the collective, you know, like social justice version of like, oh, let's always be oh, nice to each other. Like that's not real respect. No. And a lot of those, I mean, I hate to like, just label a group, but like people of that mindset usually have like the most resentment, like the, they don't have a concept of honor, right? Whereas anyone who's done martial arts for a while, you've gotten your ass kicked a bunch. Mm -hmm. So you know that you're not the shit, right? You've also beaten people up probably if you've done it long enough. Like, so you know what it feels like to dominate someone. So you know, like to not be an asshole, right? Mm -hmm. And that translates in that to the rest of your life. Like you just know not to be an asshole, like cultures, like I'm talking ethnic cultures now where, where honor is such a big deal. Like if you look at the middle East, like the, obviously a lot of violence has been there for mm -hmm. centuries, right? There's a certain level of like, kind of underlying aggression between men this is just my perception as american who's been to them at least a few times there's kind of an underlying aggression like people men size these up each up uh, more than i think in the west but they also respect each other like once they see okay i'm i'm strong you're strong but we're not going to be assholes to each other there's like an added respect yeah that i i, I mean again this is my american view maybe i'm not misunderstanding <laughs> something but that's been my perception whereas cultures where there's no aggression everyone's nice and smiley, but there's not real respect. Yeah. And, and, you know, you need the threat of things going bad to actually respect each other. At its no, core. I a hundred percent agree with you. Cause it's kind of like now what you see is the virtue signaling idiots that are all over the place. And they're just like, yeah, we're so good. We're so nice. And it's like, and then behind closed doors, there's some of the most vicious snakes you've ever seen out there. But the thing is, mm -hmm. it's never like an in your face thing. Like me personally, I, I get in trouble at work sometimes. Cause they're like, you're too blunt. You're too truthful. I'm like, dude, I'm not a fucking politician, bro. Like, I'm not here. Like, I'm just here to do a job, whatever. And the thing is, I'm even working in a blue collar environment. But even then, it's kind of like the guy that smiles the most or whatever. He climbs the ranks. Why? Because they're looking for people that are in line with their political views. And the crazy thing is now, it's not about who everybody respects the most. It's about who can please his masters by smiling and virtue signaling and doing all the things that they want, right? 
and the thing is, it's crazy because it's kind of before I used to see it like a thing that was almost external. But now I see that that mindset or that philosophy is seeping into like every part of our society now. And the mm -hmm. issue for me now becomes is like, as men, I think the number one currency and I, I don't remember where I read this man, but it stuck with me for the rest of my life where it's like women want love, men want respect. If you live mm -hmm. in a culture where men respect each other, and we respect each other enough to work with each other alongside each other, and that respect is mutual, we can get a lot more done. And the thing is, collectively, you don't have to worry about like, yo, if we're going to fight, we're going to fight, right? But it's it's more of a an honor system that kind of goes along with it, right? It's kind of like mm -hmm. back in the day where you joke around, oh, in the 90s, you know, you'd fight and then you'd be friends again. You know, whereas yeah. now it's like, we're going to gossip about this. And, you know, like, <laughs> it's just a different yeah. culture we're gonna cancel around you. <laughs> Yeah, dude. Yeah. Yeah. Because it, it, it's mob rule, right? Because in the past, it was it was it was man in rule right so if you if you disrespected a guy he would fight you you know and you settled it out like man to man you know i'm conceptually right but now you disrespect with someone he gets his mob to cancel you mm -hmm. so you like everyone is you know it's like you're saying like the people who get rewarded in most workplace environments are the the biggest ass kissers as opposed oh, to you know yeah. In the Mongolian steppes, you know, a thousand yeah. years ago, that guy would have been kicked out because they only respected men who actually were competent and could do things and could back up with their words, essentially. Yeah. And I mean, the other thing that I was going to ask you in regards to that was like, if you have a guy that's never felt respect before, right, like a guy that you might be working with and he may not have the respect of his colleagues or his family or whatever, what are some exercises that you would get him to kind of do to kind of develop like that confidence that will lead to him being respected by his community, by, you know, his peers and people around him? Well, it would depend on the person's situation, right? I would find, I would find some specific instance where he was maybe placating too much, give him something to try that was within, you know, within reason, right? Like, you know, people can't go from zero to 60 in a day. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, but again, it would, it would come back to, and actually this is something personal to me because as I was developing myself and, and working on different aspects of myself, one of the things that was a total foreign concept to me was the concept of dominance. Like I had heard yeah. dating coaches be like, oh yeah, women like dominant men. I was like, okay, that, that makes sense. I even heard from women like, oh yeah, I like, kind of like being dominated in the bedroom and like all of this stuff, but it was such an abstract idea. Like I couldn't imagine why anyone should be dominant, why anyone <laughs> would want to be dominated. You know, like I remember like, with an early, like a, a girlfriend from when I was young, like getting the fuzzy handcuffs. Cause like, oh yeah, women like, it's like, it, but it was totally, <laughs> I had no idea. Like I was totally an alien until I started to really understand how on a deep, deep level, people need to depend on each other. Yeah. And usually it's asymmetric, right? Like your child depends on you. You don't depend on your child no. in a normal hetero relationship. The woman depends on a man not in the same, like he might depend on her for some things, but it's usually unidirectional. Like that's kind of the law. Like we depend on our leaders. The leader doesn't depend on us in the same way. Right. It's, mm -hmm. it's, that's just, that's just how mammals get together. Like being equal is not being symmetrical is not a normal thing yeah. in, in, in social among social mammals. And that, you know, anyway, I'm going a little far, but to answer your question, when I first under, like when I first understand, understood how it actually feels good to direct people. It feels good to be, you know, take charge when it's called for and have that respect uh, given to me. It's like, it's like a primal chemical reward that feels so good, right? That made a lot more sense than all the sex books I read of how to dominate a woman or all the leadership <laughs> books of like how to, you know, win friends. It's like, oh, when you actually feel it relationally, it's like, oh, this person looks up to me and yeah. I'm, you know, and, and being a parent, I'm, I have a two-year-old, so I'm, I'm new to this, yeah. but knowing when she really depends on me, it's like such a primal reward that motivates me to want to do better by her, which exactly. means being strong, making good decisions, not being a loser, all of these things. But it applies to everything, right? It applies to a woman you're dating. It applies to your colleagues, right? Like when you actually feel that, and it, and it just goes back to the thing I was saying earlier, like ultimately for me, everything is instincts. I want to align instincts with intention. Yeah. And when someone gets that feeling reward that it actually feels better to do hard things and have the respect of your peers than it does to watch porn and play video games all day, <laughs> then you don't have to tell him you should do that, right? Because yeah. it actually feels better. Like it feels better to eat the steak than the candy bar. Yeah. And that's- that's kind of like, once someone's in that mode, I, th I feel like they can kind of fix their own life or they're kind of on autopilot from then on, 100%. which is what I hope for all people. Yeah, no. And I love that approach. Cause it's kind of like, to your point, and 
I 100%, you know, I, I was down that rabbit hole for a long time too, where it's like, I'm going to read more books and I'm going to do this and I'm going to do that. And sometimes it's almost like when you have that coaching of somebody telling you like, hey, listen, in your life, you're lacking here. If you do this, you know, it'll help you. And you're like, in what way? And you start doing it. You follow a system and all of a sudden you actually get those feelings, right? And that's mm -hmm. kind of where that brain heart connection kind of comes in that I'm a big totally. believer in. And that's what really spurs you down that you know, down the new path where you have the momentum. And that's where that drive really starts to kick in. Cause you're just like, okay, this is starting to make sense. Maybe I'm gonna put that book down and go work on some of these exercises in my day-to-day -day life. Cause if I develop these habits, right, it'll change uh, how my life actually looks like in the next 10, 15 years. Maybe I won't be in my mom's basement eating Cheetos and playing <laughs> video games and jacking off all day. Right. So I find that that's instrumental to getting people to move in the right direction. And one of the things that you mentioned there was confidence and that's, you know, leading my next question, because I saw, you know, you, you talked about it in a podcast with the sexual confidence aspect where you realize it's kind of like, bro, these fuzzy, <laughs> these fuzzy, you know, whatever they are, the handcuffs are not going to work. And that's mm -hmm. not really domination. What was the biggest thing that made you have that shift in the bedroom that went from like ED, all the stuff you suffered to developing sexual confidence into like, hey. I got this, you know, I'm here to dominate, you know, obviously in a good way, but I'm not here to like do all that crazy BDSM. Well, I don't know, maybe BDSM, but to each their I own. Mean, actually, I, I learned a lot from BDSM. You know, I mean, I, I did a lot of workshops when it comes to sexuality because I had, I had an issue in that area. Yeah. Um, well, I'll, I'll say my experience with, with BDSM specifically. I, so I, I was in a space where I was like, I, I was developing myself in different ways. I'd recently overcome AD. I started taking BDSM workshops because I kept getting the feedback from the world, but also friends and people and women I was dating, like, oh, you're not, I mean, you're yeah. not very dominant. Like you're, you're, you're kind of weak in this area. And it, you know, it was obviously frustrating to hear, but, but real feedback obviously is important. And a lot of the kink stuff, it's not really, doesn't really appeal to me. Like I'm not into whips and chains or leather. Like it just, I don't know. It's great for, if you're into it, but you know, actually there's a friend of mine who's on my podcast a lot, Omar Pani. I took some of his workshops and he really went into the psychology of it, right? It's yeah. not about the shows or the wearing leather or anything like that. On a very primal level, women want to be consumed. Interesting. They want it, right? It's yeah. not about being dominant so that you can like make other men feel bad or, or pad your ego. It's like, it's part of the human mating ritual, right? And you can see this mm -hmm. in other species too. Like women want to be consumed. They want to be consumed by someone stronger than them because that's the only person that consumed them and someone who wants, also cares about them, right? They don't want to be, you know, violated, right? But they want to be taken by someone who, who proves, not because they're nice, not because they're following the cultural codes, but proves undoubtedly that they are worthy of impregnating them. And this is not, this is kind of what I, I end up interpreting. And then, you know, with enough hands-on practice, you get that feedback of like, oh, women actually are more relaxed when I take control in the right way, right? In the yep. way where I'm responding to them, the way I respond to my child or respond to like in a leadership position. There's not, it's not about doing whatever you want. It's about recognizing the feedback you're getting, doing what's important. And then when she surrendered in the BDSM world, they call it subspace. Like it's, yeah. uh, it's, it's where a woman kind of goes into an intoxicated uh, uh, state of consciousness because she's so submissive, maybe she's tied up or something. Men also go into, or doms go into dom space. Like when you feel that something, I don't know, maybe someone will do a study on this one day, but I'm pretty <laughs> sure some chemicals get released where you also go into altered state because you know, you're, you, you've been, you've, her body has said, yes, you can have me. Like, mm -hmm. I want you to take me. And it feels really good. And when I, when I first felt dom space, I was like, Oh, now I understand, right? It's not about this checklist that the pickup artists say of how to be dominant <laughs> or stand this way or talk, yeah. slap people on the back, right? It's about, it's about serving her biology, right? Our reproductive instincts. And then outside of the bedroom, I think it, it applies to a lot of things like leadership and parenting. Actually, some people think this is a weird analogy, but I think all power dynamics, even sexual power dynamics run off the parent-child template, right? Mm -hmm. That's why in the BDSM world, you have like terms Mommy, like daddy, daddy and baby. Yeah, yeah right? No woman wants to be with a boy unless she's got something that's kind of a pathology or a kink in my opinion. Yeah. Every woman wants to be with daddy. Why? Because just like when she was a little girl, just like when we were kids, we enter a surrendered, playful feeling state in the presence of a stronger parent. Mm -hmm. And I think that all gets triggered in, in the sexual realm. And this is kind of going into Jungian stuff. Like a lot of sexual things have little to do with sex and more to do with survival, but it yeah. comes out a lot of kinks are really about survival or 
things and then they kind of kind of come out in sexuality because that's a way our unconscious expresses itself expresses itself yeah man i was gonna say the same thing it's 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 really weird because i remember when i first started looking into young and stuff i'm like this is very very odd <laughs> you know and then will i'm mm -hmm. right too with the orgone yeah. machine how orgasms work and the expressions with it and how like you can heal and all this stuff in regards to sexual energy but the psychology behind it is fascinating but really weird sometimes too like like the way I was, I was, I was learning about it. I'm like, this, it makes sense, but it shouldn't, you know, it almost feels almost dirty in a way. Cause you're like, wait a minute. Mm -hmm. She's just looking for that father's love from, from like, you know, the daddy in the situation and that whole submissiveness kind of side of things. It's almost like, you're right. It's like in order for you to really have a woman submit herself fully to you, you got to dominate. And it's almost like, you know, in the same way that she would just, you know, feel that comfort, that relaxation, that safety. And there's a guy that I talk to all the time and he's, uh, he's big into BDSM. He has a full slave book and all this stuff. And he's like, all you right. should totally make one. I'm like, I'm not into it. He's like, I tie her up to the toilet. I'm like, that's really weird. <laughs> <laughs> but I remember he told me a story in regards to that one time where um, he said he was a chick and, you know, he had met her off some uh, fat website. Long story short, you know, she wanted to do the thing, but at first she was like, oh, super tense, super tense. And then finally, it's almost like you mentioned that before she got into that altered state of consciousness where she just kind of relaxed. And he's like, I literally felt her energy just give herself like to me. Right. And he's like, and in that moment, we enjoyed it from there. And he's all about whips and chains and all that crazy stuff. Right. And that's kind of where I got into like the philosophy of like, what's going on here? You know, it's like, well, is, is this just something like a fetish that certain people have? Does it stem from, or does it stem from like childhood trauma? Like what's going on here? But to your yeah. point, you know, now that, you know, the older I get, the more I realize, okay, these things and these patterns, they exist for a reason. And there's a lot of things that when you start to uncover it, right, you start peeling back the layers, it starts to make sense. Even though it seems abstract, it's not, it's like, it's all connected. Yeah, I think, uh, you know, this is why I'm so into like the Jung's concept of archetypes. Like there are these programs in our psyche that we evolve to have. Mm -hmm. Some, for, in some people, it's like almost like a, a gene being activated. Like maybe in some people because of a trauma or something strange in their upbringing, it goes to an extreme level. Or like, you know, a lot of the, the colloquialisms we have, like a woman with daddy issues, maybe the masculine was missing from her life. So she seeks it in kind of an extreme way later in life, whatever mm. the thing is. And men have the, obviously the same thing with the mommy issues and whatever. Um, but every straight woman I've ever spoken to, and I have spoken to a lot of women about their sexuality, they all want something around the same thing. Like there's these mm. archetypal desires. And I think in men, because of at least men our age were conditioned a certain way, things like dominance and aggression and being a predator, they're so taboo in our culture that maybe it's very muted. But when men actually get to experience it in a healthy, safe, consensual way, it feels so rewarding mm -hmm. in a way that it doesn't for women and, it, and, and the vice versa. And actually I'll say, you know, on the flip side of like the daddy stuff, one of the biggest complaints, like, I, cause I coach couples too. One of the biggest complaints I see across the board is when, um, a boyfriend becomes, uh, become, they, uh, like, they develop like a mother son dynamic, right? Oh. You see this a lot in dysfunctional relationships where like, she kind of ends up taking care of him. He ends up kind of regressing into like a, a not dominant state. And what do you, what do you see? A lot of times you see codependence, but never a good sex life. Never. Right. It just doesn't work like that. Right. And you know, there's reasons why we can end up in this way. One thing, and this is actually like a theory I'm working on. So it's like kind of uh, incomplete, but I speak to a lot of men about their sexuality, obviously, and what they're into and how things change. And I've kind of noticed my sample size is small. So I'm, I'm not saying this is like a law of nature, but when men shift their porn preferences or their sexual fantasy preferences from like MILF stuff where the, the, the main, the, the man is a boy mm -hmm. to dominant stuff, that's usually a sign that something has really shifted. And I'll say I'm, I'm in that sample, right? Like, as a young 20 year old, I was really into MILF stuff, right? I was yeah. just drawn to it. And now it has no appeal to me, right? And, mm -hmm. and I think that transition happened around when I actually embraced the, the dominant side of my masculinity of like, oh, this actually feels better than being pampered. This yeah. actually feels better than like feeling like mom is watching me because those guys usually have issues with women too, right? Mm -hmm. Jung called it the mother complex, right? Like your mom is taking up the space in your brain that's reserved for a woman, like a, a, you know, a sexual partner, right? So those guys usually end up going into nice guy syndrome when they do start dating or they become like, they end up simping a lot because like mo their mother is like actually taking up that space in their brain that is reserved for 
adult sexual relations. That's interesting. So and that's super fascinating because I'm like, now that you have, oh, man, you got the couple there. That means you can pick the minds of both people involved and you can actually see what that looks like in real time, I guess, when it's kind of like, hey, man, the dynamic here is off along with these weird shifts and like behavior along with preference. That's really, really, I mean, that's captivating to me, but very strange too. Like I said, man, when it comes to sexual expression and what people do in regards to their sexuality, it's almost like it's so linked to your psychology. It's, it's just, yeah, it, like it's, it's, it's out of your control. It that's, is. That's what I yeah. think is so interesting. Like there's a few elements, you know, I think what you find funny, what turns you on. I think, I think, I mean, sex and comedy are the things I go to, like, <laughs> like those are things you can't control, right? It comes mm -hmm. from such a primal level that almost like if you're in a culture that says you're not allowed to joke about that, like some subject, it actually makes it more funny, right? Yeah. If you're in a culture that says like, you're not allowed to desire these things. Usually those are the cultures that have that fetishize the certain most. things because, because like your unconscious, which just wants to procreate, like your instincts, they just want to make babies mm -hmm. the best way possible. It doesn't want to, you know, yeah, separate you from certain kinds of desires, certain races of people or anything. It wants every, it wants what's good for it. It wants what's in line with nature and sex and comedy. And I'll focus on sex. Like it, it, you can't, it's the last part of the psyche that can be untouched by culture which is why controlling cultures like totalitarian dictatorships, they always try to control sex. They also try to control yeah. comedy, right? They tell you yeah. what you can laugh at, right? Because if you can control those things, you can kind of control people's feelings. Well, that kind of goes back to the whole cancel culture side of things, right? It's kind of, mm -hmm. I remember when Dave Chappelle came up with the alphabet people thing and everybody was up in arms like, this is, this is ridiculous, blah, blah. Meanwhile, it's kind of like 90% of the people out there were digging it. They were laughing. They're, they're like, hey, finally, somebody's shedding light on this, on this, on this topic in a way that's still semi-respectful, but in a mm -hmm. way that we can laugh at the situation because we want to laugh. We want to smile. And the thing is, it's like, everybody's telling us this is taboo. You shouldn't go near it with a 10-foot pole, but then you get a comedian who comes out here and makes light of the situation. And mm -hmm. I think that's the genius behind comedians is that they're able to take all these topics and be like, hey, let's poke a little fun at it. Right. Yeah. And then, you know, what happens? We all laugh as a collective. And then what happens to the comedian now in this day and age? It's like, hey, he's got to get canceled. He can't say these things. Andrew Schultz, yeah. man, you can't say those things, even though you're the yeah. number one, like top performer on YouTube when it comes to the stand up that he did. You know, it's like, I don't know if we can really let this guy fly, because if we have an agenda as a government <laughs> or as a dominating state, you know, we can't really have these people out here telling people they can laugh at this. Totally. And it's almost like, you know, it's like they don't want because the laughter is healing, right? Like you laugh yeah. about a taboo subject, especially a room full of people with different backgrounds can, and can find something funny. It's like, now you're on the same page. Like, it's like, yes. all right, that thing maybe sucks about life, but like we laughed about it. We're not going to let it get us down. Whereas canceling someone for making people genuinely laugh is like almost preventing like collective healing. Like you're not mm -hmm. letting us go there. And I don't know, we don't have to go into the deep conspiracies, but there could be, and there's a lot of reasons why you wouldn't want people healed, right? Like if people really felt they were whole, they wouldn't need to buy as much stuff. They wouldn't mm -hmm. need like, you know, a lot of products would be out of business. A lot of, you know, anyway, I'm not going to go too deep into Eddie Bravo <laughs> land, but there's a lot of things we can all think of. Like we wouldn't need that thing if we actually felt good about ourselves and those things make money. Yeah. And the thing is, ultimately, when it comes down to comedians and all that, I kind of feel like it, it, it kind of goes back to Sun Tzu's art of war, you know, make an example of one, the rest will follow. And I think mm -hmm. when we see the biggest people on the biggest stages being canceled for the most minute things, you know, like one word here, one word there, whatever the case may be, like Kobe's biggest fine, 85K, look that one up, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, when you start to look at these things, I do think that they do, I don't want to say... That's kind of where it goes into the conspiratorial side of things or, you know, the demiurge and they want to keep us down and blah, blah, blah. And then when you shine as a human being, they want to almost stifle that light and just kind of keep it down. But I think that's the beauty of, you know, comedians. And I think that's the beauty of what we do in our sex lives, too, when it's healthy. It's almost mm -hmm. like you're just allowed to be yourself and you're allowed to express yourself freely, right? Male or yeah. female, you know, and kind of when you're in those situations, whether you're laughing or, you know, you're releasing and having that glorious orgasm with the person you love, it's it's one of the most releasing, most healing, most beautiful situations you can find yourself in. Totally. Yeah. And, and on the, you know, kind of maybe extreme side or like sexual trauma stuff. I mean, this is kind of a common theory that a lot of fetishes develop, maybe not even doesn't even have to do with sex, but you know, sometimes it does like say like a, a woman who was raped might have yeah. a particular kind of rape fantasy. A lot of women who weren't raped also have rape fantasies. Cause I think that is kind of an archetypal thing, but, um, 
you know, someone might want to revisit like an emotional moment in their life, add sexuality, like almost fetishize it because mm -hmm. they're bringing pleasure into this thing that was emotionally painful. And that kind of takes the pain away. It could, at least that's yeah. one theory, which is why, you know, if you look at, you know, uh, I'm actually working on, a, on an episode right now because uh, Pornhub is about to release their year in review. And it's I actually think it's interesting year by year seeing what people search for. Cause like you see, it's like sometimes, sometimes it's obvious. Sometimes it's like, why are people into that? <laughs> but during, during COVID mask porn was a big thing. Like a lot of people were, were, were into that, you know? Yeah. It was just, it was just porn, but with like COVID masks on, right. Like, or, you know, you see this a lot with like, um, Interesting. you know, uh, if, if you, if you click on the hente stuff, like, you know, yeah, whatever yeah. is a popular cartoon you, you see sex for, it's like, you think like, why, why is it like that? It's because people are feeling maybe dissatisfied with their life. They end up watching a certain show and bringing sexuality into it. It's almost a way to like relieve the pain. Interesting. You know, I, I don't, I don't know if this is, I mean, some people theorize people who are really into the kink world and like talking about the psychology say like, this is an important thing. I don't actually know if it's healing or if it's just another way. I, I'm not sure actually, but what I do know is that people tend to sexualize dissatisfying parts of their life. Interesting. Right? Like yeah. sex is kind of a way to take it over. And actually, you know, this, this is an idea from Jung that I kind of, I'm kind of remixing, but the whole thing of the, the Oedipal complex, you know, where you want to you know, kill your father and marry your mother or sleep with your mother, if that was from Freud originally, I actually don't think it has that much to do with sex. I don't think you know, Freud thought every boy wants to bang his mom secretly. Like, I don't think that's true. Like that's, although I think that is, you know, the, you know, uh, I think it, what it represents is you're trying to conquer your mother dominating your life, right? Mm -hmm. That, that fantasy of sleeping with a, you know, you know, whatever version of the mill fantasy, it's like a way of kind of conquering the mother archetype in your mind because when you have sex with a woman, you are no longer in the submissive role. Typically, if you're a man, it's like kind of mm -hmm. a way of conquering that and becoming equals with your father archetypally. And yes. at least that's my theory. No, yeah. right. It's like, it's like, it's like, if you can elevate yourself to sexual peer, your, your subconscious concept of your mother can't see you as a little boy anymore. Right. Exactly. So kind of like you conquered her. Yeah. So I think that's the root of the Oedipus complex. Not that everyone wants to, you know, <laughs> commit incest or anything like that. But no, if you look at it from like a conceptual kind of like way, it's it's almost like you've always held your father up here and you've always been down here. And then in doing mm -hmm. that, it's like I've conquered and I've surpassed, like I've leveled up essentially. Yeah. So yeah, it's almost actually, like freeing that way. Yeah. And I think the 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 part of the the you know, Freudian concept of the killing your father. I don't think it's actually that you want to kill your father, although maybe some guys have anger. It's like, <laughs> it's more like you're, you're taking his place as the representative of your mm -hmm. genetic line. That, yeah. That's what I think it really said. Like, you know, it's like, I'm a man now. You procreated last generation. You made me. Now it's my turn to procreate with women. Like, it's like, it's like, it's not about killing your father. It's about replacing him in your bloodline, which is what everyone eventually has to do. You have Exactly. So it's almost like the leader of the pack, right? It's either, you know, the yeah. old one always ends up, you know, it's like, hey, you can't be alpha all your life. Like your time is done. Then boom, you know, you're done. And that's it. And I guess this is one of the ways that you can find yourself express. Well, one of the ways to express it, I guess. But the other thing that I, I wanted to go back to was the whole thing with the mass. Like, I mean, because that for me is very like, I, I would have never thought of that. But do you think that as a society, people will have the same fantasies based off of what they're like living in real life? Yeah, I think it's specifically things you're dissatisfied like I, with, I mean, it's like things that kind of annoy you. Like it's so like the mass, know, like, cause most people hated it. Like I hated it, but yeah, it's like, it's like a control on your life. So like kind of, I think a subconscious way of coping with it is you sexualize it. Right. And, and you see this with like, you know, maybe kids having teacher fantasies, like they yeah. hate being controlled by their mean teachers. So they, you know, they, they, they fantasize about sleeping with a teacher, right. That that's kind of like maybe a, a normal 13 year old fantasy. I don't know. <laughs> um, and things like that, right? Like, like it's almost a way of overcoming it is, is sex. And, and this is, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm taking this kind of from Jungian theories, but I think it's, it, it fits with what I've observed. Interesting, man. I mean, you got a small sample size, but what you're talking about kind of makes sense. If you're seeing these patterns that are kind of showing up, that means that there's something to it, right? And if mm -hmm. there's something to it, you know, you could probably dig into that a little bit more. I mean, as your sample size kind of grows, maybe, you know, you could run a clinical, well, maybe not a clinical study, but a small case study just to kind of see how things play out or pan out in the future too. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, I, I just thought about it on the fly while we were talking, but earlier it's like someone should do a study on dom space and subspace. <laughs> I, I'd be curious what happens neurochemically because like when you see, you see it sometimes like in a, in a scene 
women can, and, and I think most men or most people have seen like if a woman's really having a good time in a sexual setting, it is a very deep altered state of consciousness that I don't think men get into naturally. Mm -hmm. I just think it's interesting. Who knows what's going on in the brain? Yeah. Well, that's one of the things it's kind of like, I mean, I've talked to, well, mainly my wife, but it's kind of like when it's orgasm, right? It's almost like for them, it's more of that spiritual space almost where mm -hmm. they go into something that's completely different. Whereas for me, it's it's almost not always completely physical, right? Because it's obviously mind, body, soul. It's a very holistic experience too. And, you know, you're done and you just feel like, ah, you know, I feel refreshed. But, mm -hmm. you know, what I find for her, it's almost like spiritual, man. Like, it's like almost like, you know, like in French, I know they call the orgasm le petit mart or mark yeah, or whatever more, or it's like yeah, yeah little death little death yeah and i think there's yeah. something to that I, I don't think they just came up with that like oh this sounds good let's make it call the orgasm that like for females i think it's literally something that almost takes them out of the body you know like uh yeah well one of my one of my instructors in sexuality would always say you can't take yourself out of control and they actually did a study at Rutgers where um they showed that the brain and they specifically did with women, like their, their brain activity is different if they orgasm by themselves or orgasm with a partner. Like in, if they orgasm by themselves, their amygdala, which is like kind of like the, the danger detector is still active because you're by yourself. But if, if it's with a partner, it shuts off. So they could obviously go in deeper into orgasm because they know someone else is holding the perimeter. Right. And I think that is why, at least with hetero people, uh, women can go so much further into like altered states in pleasure because they know the man is, is watching the door. <laughs> they know the man yeah, is yeah, like guarding, yeah. guarding the perimeter. Whereas like, if you're a man, you know, I think it's great to be in a, in a, in a receptive state sometimes, you know, but you're usually the one guarding the door, right? You're usually <laughs> the one paying attention to what's going on. So you can't like let yourself go so to a deep, you know, into other that's, dimensions. You know? That's for, no, that's, that's honestly pretty interesting. Cause like I said, man, like the experience is different for, for male versus female. And the thing is too, it's kind of like the female orgasm, you know, it's like, it's intense, man. It's a lot, I'd say it's a lot more intense than the male orgasm, in my opinion, and it lasts longer and everything. Mm -hmm. Right. So it's like, it's one of those things where it's like literally mind, body, and soul. It's almost like, ah, you know, they're in complete bliss. Whereas, you know, you feel good, but you're still there you're making sure no predators coming in through the door. You know, you're, you're still, mm -hmm. you're feeling it, but it's a different experience. Yeah. For sure. The one thing I did want to touch on a little bit again, so it's kind of like we're talking about females in that. And now, you know, switching gears just a little bit, because I had this written down here in regards to the com well, part of the conversation I wanted to have today, but handling women's emotions. Because we did talk about, mm -hmm. you know, a lot of the male psychology, you know, a lot of the way that, you know, we think as dudes and stuff. But when it comes to handling women's emotions, and, you know, you get a client who's still working on his own confidence and, you know, his own issues how does he go about handling the woman's emotions simultaneously yeah well i think actually i just posted something about this for my men's facebook group so i have i have an answer good uh, <laughs> I got my, on my, in my mind already but um it's like a lot of guys are way too reactive and then actually i'll go back to something i said earlier in that you know, power dynamic relationships, most intimate relationships are intimate. And I think the parent child relationship is kind of the core for all of us. Like it's like deep mm -hmm. in our psyche of like, you know, being a small child, that's like the ultimate surrender. You trust your parent. You might, you might cry when they say you, they, you can't eat ice cream for dinner. You might, you might yell, you might tantrum, but ultimately you do all of that. And like little kids, I'm learning this now as a new father, like they treat, they, they're, they're the worst behaved with their own parents. They're the worst behaved with their mothers, I think, because they get the most comfort from their mom. They're not, they're pretty good behaved with like other random people because they know that the other person might abandon them. Mm -hmm. They know mom is never going to abandon them. Right. So that's kind of why we give shit to the people we love the most, unfortunately. Um, so, you know, so back to your question, it is normal for a woman to give you shit mm -hmm. if she is an intimate relationship. Now, obviously there's a line where like, it is, you know, tests can turn into, you know, uh, I hurt her taking power and losing attraction for you. But at the most core thing, I think men need to understand women are going to have emotions no matter what. For a woman, it's not even about having negative versus positive emotions, although the negative ones are obviously less pleasant to deal with. It's like, mm -hmm. you need to be solid there. And just like a parent to a child, you need to let them know you have things handled, you are there for them, you love them, but you're not also a punching bag. 
-hmm. right? Like, and also they can't eat ice cream for dinner, right? Like, like there's, there's a, and, and so I think, cause I think a lot of guys, they get kind of confused of like, all right, I want to be there for my woman, or I want to be there for women. I also don't want, I also want to have boundaries, but I don't want to be a dick. And it gets very confusing. Whereas, mm -hmm. I, you know, I tell guys a lot of like, look at the woman you're dating or the woman you're with when she's emotional, as if she just reverted into little girl mode, like she's not 20 something or 30 or whatever age, you know, adult age she is, like she's seven. Mm -hmm. And just think of her like that. How would you respond? Of course, if your daughter is crying, you want her to feel good, right? You want to be a good leader. You want to be a good partner. You want to be a good dad, you know, whatever, Dom, you <laughs> want her to feel good, but also you, you know what's good for her, right? She's emotional. She's not rational. You know what's good for her, which also includes showing you some level of respect. And I think that is better than trying to make a checklist again of like, oh, what are good boundaries? This, that, blah, blah, blah. What's the right alpha technique? Like, no, no, no. Just see her as a kid and be a good adult to her. I, I think like, that's the simplest way to look at it. Like the most like, you know, principled way to look at it um, to prevent you from getting overreactive, right? Because, you know, I'm not perfect. You know, I, you know, I lose my cool with my wife or whatever sometimes, but usually if I can stay in that mindset, I can have real compassion rather than like some fake kind of like, I'm trying to, I'm trying to just make her feel better. So she stops yelling or stop crying or whatever. Like women are gonna have emotions. I'm just holding the perimeter for you. Like it, it is, is imp impossible for a child to go through childhood without crying. It's impossible for a woman to be in a relationship without challenging the man with some kind of challenging emotions. And that said, the flip side of it is if like, you know, if it's at the level of true disrespect, which I think in most relationships, women aren't meaning to be disrespectful when they're you know, giving you shit, like they're maybe subconsciously testing you, maybe they just need to release and you're the person who's the authority in their life. Um, but if it gets to the point where there's really disrespect, you need to also recognize that mm -hmm. of like, okay, maybe this is not someone I should stay with, or this, you know, I need to lay a hard boundary, I have to tell her how it is. And it's okay for her to be upset about that, right? I don't have to be afraid of her negative emotions, because same, same thing, like the kid is going to cry when you say they can't watch TV all night. The mm -hmm. woman might cry when you put up a boundary, especially if you've gone through months or years of a relationship where you acted beta and she's used to dominating you. The first time you put up a boundary, the first time you actually lay down the law in a healthy way, hopefully, mm -hmm. is you're going you're gonna to have some negative reactions, normal. But don't take it personally, do what's right. Damn. No, that was spot on, man. So it was perfect. <laughs> that was a perfect way to cool. end the show, Ruan, because honestly... Mm -hmm. You know, I learned a lot today and I'm always learning. And that's the beauty of life. I realized that I'm probably not going to stop learning until the day I die. So, you know, it was awesome to have this conversation with you and learn all these different. And I mean, I honestly feel like we just scraped the surface because I, I still had like an, another million things that I want to go over with you. But I love this, man. And honestly, this was really, really eye opening. And the only thing I want to close off with now is um, where can we find you? All the details, where can we follow you? If you could let us know all your the websites, social media links, all that good stuff. Yeah, ruando.com is my website and has the links to everything. Um, my podcast is Ruando Podcast. Uh, it's on all the, all the apps, YouTube, Spotify, Apple. And um, yeah, and I also have a program based in archetypal psychology called the Mask and Archetype Challenge. It's 21 days of exercises where you get a journal, you get to follow along with a group. It also comes with a coaching session with me where we go into like these deeper principles based in a lot of Jung's teaching, but applied to modern day where you're trying to get in touch with your masculine instincts, those testosterone driven instincts. I call it the masculine archetype because it's like that embedded program where the things that we, we talked about today, like where it actually feels good to be dominant in a healthy way, where it feels good to access that warrior energy, where you're letting your instincts drive you in a positive direction rather than being in your head all the time so that's at uh, ruando.com slash archetype and um yeah man thanks for having me this was super fun actually you should come on my podcast Mickey. i'm down keep bro, talking man. about this stuff yeah, yeah dude, let's I'm do down, it man <laughs> yeah we'll schedule something for later yeah it'd be cool 100 percent, man and again guys the links are always in the description had a great time ruan you killed it man can't wait to talk to you again bro for sure take it easy all right take care guys